Please, Igor. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And even more thanks for arranging the whole seminar program altogether. It keeps me up to 2 a.m. every Thursday. But yeah, I enjoy it. Thank you very much. So today, uh, in detail, we'll be talking about wild sums in all sizes, which is a joint work with Chen Gao Chen and Bryce Kerr. Uh, we did it while we uh, all, uh, while all three of us were here at UNSW, and now we all left for different locations. Okay. So let me start with basic definitions. Assume that we are given a vector of real numbers, which uh, belongs to the unit cube of dimension D. And in fact, it's more convenient to think about this cube as a torus. So we reduce everything modulo one. So T of D is this d-dimensional unit torus. And then our main object of study is the following while sum, which we denote S sub D un. It depends on three parameters. D is the degree of the polynomial on the exponent. U is uh, the coefficients and N is the variable of summation. And E of X is the exponential function of X with the coefficient two pi I. So these are all unit vectors. And as the name suggests, they're named after Herman Weil, who introduced and instigated uh, the sums and more significantly, he foresaw the great value for mathematics uh, more than 100 years ago. And just in case, if you forget the definition, instead of putting the title and my name at the foot of each slide, I decided it would be more useful to put the definition. So I hope you can see it. So this definition will be always with you. And there is another set which will appear a little bit later. We'll talk about this. Okay. So when uh, Herman Weil introduced the sums, he almost immediately found two very important applications. And actually that was the motivation to introduce the sums. In 1916, he proved that the sums can be used to show some uniformity of distribution results of fractional parts of values of real polynomials. And actually even now, 100 years later, we don't really know how to deal with this question otherwise, how to show the fractional parts of polynomials are uniformly distributed. And with only one exception, there is a dynamical approach of Furstenberg, which however still loses to the original approach it gives quantitatively weaker results. And after this, a few years later, he also found another exciting application. Namely, he proved the first so-called subconvexity, subconvexity bound for the even zeta function, which is this uh, first non-trivial result towards the still open Lindelof conjecture. And of course, since that time, lots of other applications were found. And here is certainly a very incomplete list uh, People obtained new bounds for the zero free region of the zeta s, uh, uh, solved some other problems like wiring problem and many other additive problems, uh, found bounds of short character sums and also of L functions for highly composite model, uh, investigated low lying zeros of L functions and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a very incomplete list, as I said. And there are some actually very surprising applications, which on a, at the first glance has nothing to do with number theory. And maybe later I will describe some of them. For example, uh, last year, Erdogan and Shakan found links between bounds of some very special wild sums and partial differential equations, a very unexpected link. Okay, now let me first explain what we, we know about wild sums and then we talk about things which we do not know. And now knowledge can be kind of classified into two particular, into two classes, average values and individual bounds. And I start with average values. So for average values, uh, of course, uh, you can trivially prove that the average square is and it's nothing but a possible identity, a completely trivial result. But if you make one step forward, and decide to look at higher moments, for example, for the first moment, the equation becomes highly non-trivial. For example, uh, there's no easy way to say anything meaningful 
against the fourth moment of, of the wild forms and finding estimates of this type, integral of all possible vectors, u vectors of coefficients of polynomials over the unit um, cube Td for S2, 3, and so on. Uh, usually known under one collective name, Winograd was mean value theorem, but it's better to use plural because there are several modifications. So, well, it depends on your point of view whether you want to treat it as one theorem as a, uh, or as a series of theorems. And I will be abbreviating this uh, Vm Vt, and it solves the problem with this extra s. It will be compressed in t. So, why we call it Vinogradov's mean value theorem? It's because Vinogradov in 1935 obtained its first non trivial bounds on this quantity, j sub gs of n, and actually with the right saving. And we talk about uh, this uh, in a little uh, later. What is the right saving? How can you estimate this? moments. So the saving was right, but he achieved this right saving for the values of S slightly higher than one would expect. And we know that it was kind of right expectation. So he went a little bit um, far up with the values of S for which the S is bound. And uh, he also linked this average, average bounds to individual bounds. So he obtained it first non-trivial results within his method, which for large values of D were much stronger than the result of Herman Weil and some other researchers. Well, so he kind of opened this direction and after works of many other people, most significantly Vinogradov, Korobov, Kratsuba, Ford, Von, Woolley, and I'm sure many other people. So, 80 years later and several dozen papers later, we have the following, which is the optimal Vinogradov's mean value theorem. So what we know now is the following estimate. So for any, for any S starting from two, this integral, the average S moments of, the, of while sums can be estimated by sum of two terms, n to the S and n to the two S minus D times D plus one over two. And I ignore little o in the exponent. I will never mention them, even if, of course they will present in essential all estimates I write today. So this result, which is optimal, and I will explain uh, in a second why I call it optimal, is due to Trevor Woolley for d equals three. Three, it was appears 2016. Then at about the same time, we've gained the meta and goods establishes for d greater equal four. And actually this is their method had so it didn't seem to work for d equals three as far as I understand. And a few years later, Vuli uh, made another step and uh, extended this estimate to more general exponential sums with linear combinations, not just powers n, n squared, n to the d, but with linear combinations of d arbitrary polynomials. And later it will be important for us. So we'll come back to this. So, now let's discuss why we believe that this bound is optimal. And it also kind of will help to understand how one can deal with the sums and how they behave. So I want to consider a generalization of my integral j d uh, ds. I want to introduce another, another parameter, a vector lambda. So it takes the same moment as before the S moment, moment of while sums and twisted with an exponential function uh, of the uh, scalar product of lambda and u. So there is a linear, uh, linear function here in the exponent. Okay, so what I want to notice? I want to notice the following, the following identity. If we take the sum, raise them to the two S power, and open up, I will get linear combinations of this power sums. Because uh, instead of writing the absolute value of S squared, I write it at S times the conjugate S. Conjugation just changes signs in the exponent and I do it uh, S times, so I have two S terms, two from each square of S and they appear in this, in this shape. 
And of course, this linear function of lambda will be combined in the same exponent. So you have this expression. It looks very, uh, very, very cluttered, but actually they have very simple structure, which you will see on the next slide. And what I want to do next is to change the order of integration, to change the order here, and integration will move inside, and the product will go outside. So for hj from 1 to d, I have this single integral over ui, your uj, sorry. And now it's time to recall uh, the orthogonality relation. Then when you integrate this function between 0 and 1 for some integer w, you have two possible answers. It's 1 when w is 0, and it's 0 otherwise. So you will see that these integrals, they become characteristic functions of this exponent being zero or not. So if you put everything together, you see that this integral, this twisted moment, is nothing but the number of solutions to this system of equations. You have d equations, and in each equation you have s powers of n uh, of n on the left hand side and another s powers on the right hand side plus the shift lambda lambda j. Okay, now, so this number of solutions to a system of equations. Now let's come back to the previous slide and look at this. And I claim that it's obvious that when lambda is zero, when lambda is a zero vector, which corresponds to our initial definition, this integral is larger than all other integrals because it's what happens. I take this integral, take absolute values, bring it inside, use the tri uh, triangular inequality, and it will kill this exponent, and the value only goes up. So applying the absolute value, I can only increase the value. So lambda equals zero gives me the largest possible value. So, so we have this. And of course, when lambda is zero, when it's missing, I obviously have n to the s solutions. It just, I take n1 equals to ns plus one, and so on, and I don't even want to worry about uh, taking permutations. I don't care about constants. So this trivial, uh, trivial solution already gives me, give me n to the s. So n to the s should be, should be present in any upper bound because this value is at least n to the s. And it was the first term in the optimal Vinogradov's mean value theorem. So we are done with n to the s. Let's look at the second term, which was more involved. And here, I want to combine three uh, very simple uh, uh, statements. The one which, which we just used, then when lambda is zero, this value of the, the value of this fu function is bigger than all other values. Great equal, well, we don't know whether it's larger or not. Uh, now, if you sum over all lambdas, if you look at the system and put solutions for all possible lambdas, which means you have no restrictions at all, whatever lambda comes, you call it, you, you, you call it lambda j. So sum of all lambdas without any restriction is the same as the total number of, of variables we have, which is n to the s, okay? And another thing for this thing to be non-zero, lambda, j should be at most this, because lambda is given by this, this expression. And each term is at most n to the j, and you have two s terms here, but they're positive and negative, so by absolute value you have this. And we are done now, because we have that many possible values on which this function is supported, values of lambda. For each of, each of these values is at most this, so the quantity we are after, j sub d s n without any lambda at all, times this number of possibilities for lambdas is greater than the sum of all j's over all lambdas. But we know what the answer here, it's n to the s. So if you put these things together, you see that this term must also be present in, in any upper bound. This means, that the upper bound, which I gave you a few slides ago, which contained both terms, is optimal. Okay. So now that was about um, average bounds. 
what's known about individual bonds. And here, uh, I wish I could tell you something that the result is that is at least some, some of the, one of the results is optimal. I can't. Our knowledge is very, very sparse here. So what, what do you actually know? So if you use Vinogradov's method, plus the optimal form of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem, then you have the following result. Assume you have this vector u, the vector of coefficients. And also assume that for some nu between 2 and d, the linear term is no good for us. You have to know something for, for nonlinear terms in your polynomial. It's remember that u, u is a vector of coefficients of the polynomial, like in this definition in the footer. So you know that u sub nu is approximated by a rational number a over q with this precision. Of course, there are infinite many approximations of this type for any irrational number u sub nu. Well, then for this value of n here, and this value of q, and this value of nu, you have the following bound. S doesn't exceed n which is a trivial upper bound because you have n roots of unity. So this is a trivial upper bound. And now this, you have some saving because as you see, all these exponents are negative. So they give us no trouble. And there is one more term here, which can potentially be, be a troublemaker because Q comes in a positive power. But we talk about this in a, in a few moments. So here, if you have Q to the minus one and you have to rise it to this power, which of course reduces your saving, n to the minus one, again, you have to rise to this power. And here the only restriction is that q must not be very large compared to n to the new. And uh, right now, we don't really have any other plausible approach to have, have uh, to have better bounds. So uh, at some point we need some new ideas. And let me just tell you that the formulation looks very uh, involved, but it's very easy to see that any st any bound of this type must depend on the, the finite properties of the coefficients u1, ud. For example, if all of them are integer numbers, then of course you have no cancellation. You have integer numbers in the exponents, so all these uh, exponential functions take value really one, all vectors are aligned in the same direction, so you just have n. So you have to know something about uis how, how much they're different from, from integer numbers, which means that you have, have, in, have to have in some information of this type. Okay, so this would Igor, functionally everything I can say about Igor. individual bonds. So in summary, what we have, we have almost complete knowledge of average values of the wild sums. Yes. Uh, Philip, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, I had a, a question regarding the, the slide above. Uh, so the, the condition here um, is not symmetric in, in nu or in the ordering of the uh, Yes. Of the nus. Can you yes, sure. You would like to know this for the highest coefficient. Sometimes okay. you don't. Of course, you gain more when nu is large. Mm -hmm. So if you have this information for the, for the leading coefficient, it's better. Sometimes you don't. Okay. So this is why kind of the bound improves with, with your knowledge. And yes, it's not symmetric with respect, with respect to Q and N. Yeah, but this, this, this is what this method gives. Okay, so what we know, we know essentially everything you would like to about average values and know something but very little about individual behaviors of, of uh, vial sums. So what I'm going to do next, I will move to the part with some new results and I'll outline some recent results, which tell us something about the distribution of the wild sums. Namely, we look at wild sums of uh, prescribed size. And as my title suggests, they will be small, large, or close to the average values. After this, we consider kind of a, uh, an intermediate scenario which interpolates between these two cases. We consider uh, some kind of equations which combine average and individual results. And then I show how these two different directions come together 
uh, and allow us to say something interesting about the wave forms. So this is the plan. So let's talk about the distribution of values of the whale sums. So I recall our main tool, the mean value theorem. So this moment doesn't exceed n to the s coming from the diagonal, so diagonal solutions and this term, which gives you the right saving. And we call this the right saving. There are immediate implications of this. So it tells us that when S runs between one and D times D plus one over two, exactly this expression, then the first term dominates. And instead of N to the S, which would be the trivial bound, it's N to the, N to, sorry, N to the two S, which comes for free without doing anything because it's a trivial bound on this of sum, you have N to the S, which means that on average, this sum is n to the one half, which is natural to expect because you have capital N vectors and you treat them as random vectors. So you expect something to the square root cancellation. Uh, it's, it's not surprising that uh, you have n to the one half. Now, let's take the largest possible value S uh, before the second term takes over, which is this, as I said, this last term here, and they take this and it, tells us that if you ask what's the measure of the set of coefficients u for which the corresponding sum is bigger than n to the one half plus epsilon. So you add a small epsilon the exponent, a fixed positive number. And for this, you have this bound. So it's, a, it's true for a set of very small measure, n to the more or less d squared epsilon. So you know that the number of sum, the measure of the set of large sums is small for each concrete value of capital N. Okay. Now you can do actually something more interesting. You could interchange the roles of N and U and it's not immediately obvious. So what is true if you apply the mention of Rademacher theorem is formulated here. For almost all vectors of the coefficients U, and for all values, and for all sums, you still have the same bound. So you have a universal set, a small universal set of bad values of u, you throw it, and then for all sums of all lengths, you have the square root bound. Uh, it's not a very difficult proof, but it will it, it take some efforts to prove. Okay, so. Now we are ready to ask our questions. So what about typical values? We know that on average, all this moment suggests that S, the sums S, while sums should be about N to the one half. But typical values are not necessarily average values. And one of the questions, for example, is, is here, is the truth, is it, is, this, is it true that for almost all U, for almost all coefficients, for infinitely many, or maybe even for all n, the sums are at least as large as n to the one half. The fact that the average values of this order of magnitude doesn't allow us to make this claim. Now, what's about extreme values? For example, what can we say about the uh, set of u the set of coefficients for which were infinitely many n, the sums are very small, less than n to the delta. Is it a massive set? Does it exist at all? Uh, or maybe it's true for all vectors u, we do not know, at least not yet. The same thing you can ask about large values of um, s. What can we say about about sets of u in the unit torus, in the d-dimensional torus, such that for infinitely many n, these sums are very large occasionally. So all these questions are widely open. And right now, we are not even uh, able to rule out such ridiculous statements as this. Say for almost all a, for almost all u, 
in the in the uh, in the dimensional torus for all n, all the sums of of the size n to the little over one. This should be very very wrong. Nevertheless, I have no idea how to prove that it's wrong. So as far as I know, it's still a possibility, even if I would probably bet my annual salary against it. Okay, so let's try to make some quantitative statements. And now I want to introduce uh, a set E, which will be with us essentially all my talk. And it's also presented here. So the set E, it's a set of exceptional sums, which is defined as a set of U, the vectors uh, which define our polynomial in the exponent, for which uh, real sums which correspond to this u are at least n to the alpha for infinitely many n. So these are polynomials for which there, there are large sums. And I define theta of d as the infimum of all alphas for which the set of is of measure zero. So when alpha is bigger than this number, then uh, for almost all u sums are less than n to the alpha. So the exceptional set is small if, uh, if alpha is bigger than theta d. So what I said before about, about the Menshoff for the Macher theorem uh, allows us to claim that theta of d is at most one half because for almost all sums we have the square root bound with little o, but because it's inf, it makes no difference. And it's certainly very natural to make the following conjecture, which Chen Gao, Chen and I kind of put officially in our paper, but I'm sure many people would, would, would guess the same, that this is just an, an equality instead of inequality. That theta of d is one half. That everything switches when you, you pass this threshold one half. That almost all sums should be at least n to the one half and at most n to the one half in infinity of. Uh, but as I just mentioned in the previous slide, right now we are not even able to show that theta of d is positive. This ridiculous statement on the last slide would mean theta of d is zero, which of course is not, is not likely to be true. And we know nothing about this except for the case d equals two, where we have some extra tools and extra possibilities. And then we know that the conjecture is actually true. So when d is two for quadratic sums, you know the theta of two is one half. Okay. So we know very little about the set and we cannot say much about theta d, but we can say something if you measure the size of the sets, not uh, via the Lebesgue measure. This tool is too powerful for us to handle, but why house of dimension, which is kind of a more refined tool and it allows us to make some non-trivial statements. And we will be interested in the following <coughs> regimes. Uh, small whale, whale sums when alpha tends to zero. So we are interested in sets of u for which sums are bigger than n to the alpha for very small alpha, which should happen all the time, of course, but we don't know how to prove it. We will be interested in very large sums and this should be a very small set. And we are also interested in the regime when alpha tends to one half, which should be the typical case. But I put a question mark, we still don't know this. We assume it's typical behavior, we don't know this. But let's call it typical still. So this is a three kind of interesting uh, regimes of alpha. So as I mentioned, we will be using house of dimension and here point of definition, which I'm sure all of you, you know. So this is a, a lower, lower uh, the same theorem of S, such that for any epsilon, there is a cover of our set A, A, which satisfies this condition. The sum of diameters of this sets UI to the power S is less than epsilon, where the diameter is just the largest distance between two elements of U. So what do you know about the sets E sub alpha? Well, we actually know something. We cannot show that uh, they, uh, they are very massive with respect to the back measure. But 
for any alpha, we know that there is no rich, meaning that if you take this set is alpha D and intersect with any small cube inside of your D dimension torus, and then look at the intersection. This intersection is a positive Hausdorff dimension. So there are no holes in this set that's everywhere, but it's more than just everywhere. Everywhere, and there's enough kind of mass in this set. So there are many elements everywhere in the unit, in the d-dimensional unit torus. Uh, more specifically, we have the following law bound. I want to defi define uh, this quantity, kappa sub d, which is defined formally by this expression. It's probably not so interesting. What probably is important to know that uh, this limit is three quarters. And if we divide d, you have just uh, exact value kappa of d is three over four d. So if you minimize this and maximize over new, you obtain this. So, and with this definition, we have the following flow bounds. So for any small cube in the dimensional torus, when d is two, the dimension of this set, of the intersection of our set E alpha two and this cube exceeds three half, the, mean, uh, the smallest out of three halves and three minus one minus alpha. And we have a similar result, except with a slightly weaker coefficient kappa d for d greater equal three. So everywhere you have some positive value on the right hand side, which is probably the most interesting part here. And in fact, when alpha is less than one half, then uh, the second term doesn't matter anymore. And if the bound simplifies like this, it becomes three halves. And this is about three or four D. And of course, for alpha less than one half, we expect that this set would be a positive Lebesgue measure, probably a measure of uh, full measure. We don't know how to prove it. So our conjecture, which says that theta d is one half, it's exactly the threshold between small and large values of uh, sums. Uh, because if our conjecture is true and theta d is one half, then this, this set should be a Hausdorff measure. D. And in fact, we believe that even stronger holds that all these small uh, cubes should also give you an intersection of, of full, uh, a full dimension D. Uh, but as I said, it's just a conjecture and we don't really know how to approach it. So, so far, we only have this, have the slow bounds. Well, <coughs> That was a uh, result which holds for any alpha. If you consider a shorter range, then recently together with price curve, we obtained a strong result. So in the range between zero and one half, strictly less than one half, we almost have something which resembles what we want to prove. This house of dimension is a, a is at least d minus one over two d. This term must not be here, but well, so far this is uh, only thing we can, we can prove. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for the critical value one half. We really would like to have it uh, with uh, with alpha, which can take the value one half. We can't. This inequality is is strict, but we can do it for a potentially slightly larger set. So what we want to introduce, we want to introduce yet another parameter. My definition of the set E alpha D uh, says that this sums should be greater equal to the alpha. Here we need to introduce a constant C. We need to lower a little bit. And in this case, if you allow to introduce the constant C, which of course you'd have to choose less than one, or you may need to choose it less than one, then we have this inequality, the same as here, even with alpha equals one half. So this is alpha, which is now one half. And the pay price to pay is to put an extra constant here, which Vc equals one would give us what we really wanted. We cannot guarantee that C is one, we already know it exists. So 
potentially it could be less than one. And so the result is a little bit weaker than what we want. Than, than what we want. Okay, now upper bounds. Well, as I said, we certainly expect that this set is of uh, dimension, house of dimension D in this range. So we don't expect any upper bounds in this range. So we only want to talk about alpha, which is strictly greater than one half, namely about sets of coefficients of our polynomials for which uh, uh, while sums are occasionally very large, larger than the average value. So here we have the following estimate, which looks very convoluted and there's no point of reading this. It contains some expensive function u, which depends on d and alpha. But what's really uh, interesting here is that uh, if you forget about minimizing over k and just take a concrete value of k, say d minus one, then this upper bound tells you that this function u, which is an upper bound on uh, the dimension, is d minus something. So it's strictly less than d. So even we expect that the set uh, e alpha d is of house of dimension d for alpha, which are between zero and one half, inclusive both ends. It changes instantly when you bypass one half. The dimension is certainly less than d. And this is what we can prove. So it's a non-trivial bound. And now, of course, you can try to push it more and try to get better bounds. And indeed, we had kind of a several other results. Uh, we have another bound, which is a very strange shape. But it, I present it because it will bring me to the second topic, which I'm going to discuss. Namely, we have two parameters, k and d, uh, two integer parameters. And the only restriction is that k is between one and d minus one, which would be strictly less than d. Then, now we start with a bound rather than with alpha, and we adjust alpha to the bound. So we claim that the dimension of the set E sub d alpha is at most k, provided that alpha exceeds this. And again, we are interested in non-trivial bounds in the dimension. So d minus one is what we're after. We don't want to take d and it's not allowed anyway. So the largest value of k is d minus one, which still makes sense here. So with k equals d minus one, you will substitute here. You see that when alpha exceeds one half, certainly it must exceed one half, plus this function, which has a linear function of d in the numerator and a quadratic function of d in the denominator. So it decreases as one over d more or less and d is large. So if you exceed one half a little bit, the dimension already drops below d minus one. So it's just with this plus almost instantly, you have a drop in the dimension by one at least. And this bound is obtained by, as a byproduct of uh, some results on our next topic, projections of while sums. But before we leave, just a few more words about the set E alpha D. So what's the truth about this? What do we expect? Well, our upper bounds and lower bounds are very far apart. So they don't come close to each other. However, surprisingly enough, there is one regime where we are not so much off. So we essentially know, no, not the truth, but kind of semi-truth here. Namely, it's a regime when alpha comes to zero. So when alpha is of the shape one minus delta, but delta tends to zero. In this case, you know that the dimension is cornered between two linear functions of delta. So it's when delta decreases, this dimension behaves as a linear function of delta. And more precisely, we have this estimates. So uh, instead of one minus delta switch to alpha again. So delta becomes one minus alpha. So the lower limit is greater equal three and the upper limit here is at most d squared plus two d. So we know something at least three in, at least in this regime. But otherwise we have no plausible conjectures. We have no idea what one could expect for this function. So I would be very much welcome some input if someone has anything to say. Okay, <clears throat> now let's move to the next topic, projections of while sums. Again, recall that we have a complete knowledge 
of average values of the well sums. And we know something, but overall very little about individual values. So the question is whether you can interpolate it. Now, let me recall what we know for the uh, uh, individual bounds, something which I presented <coughs> at the beginning of my talk. We know that if some coefficient with a nonlinear term is approximated by a rational fraction a over q up to one over q squared standard Dirichlet approximation, then we are in business, we have this bound. So, uh, if you know something about at least one coefficient, you can ignore the rest. So if you control, say, UD, we don't care what happens to other coefficients. They could be integer numbers, and it's still a very, very interesting case, and actually, but we still have a non-trivial bound. So essentially, without doing anything, we have the following result. For almost all UD, and all other, other components of our vector u, we have this bound. It's because for almost all ud, we can choose q of this size, for example, which is a quasi-optimal choice here. Then these two terms become balanced, and the third term for this value of q gives us no trouble. It's dominated by the first two, which are equal in this case. So for almost all ud, you can always find approximations with a denominator of, of the size you control very well, so in this case, for almost all UD, and you don't care anymore what happens to other UIs. So for all of them, you have this bound. So this saving becomes six, one minus one over D minus one in the exponent of N. So we have a result which in, holds for almost all UD and all other vectors. And now you can ask what happens if you ask for a family results of this type. So what do you want to say? You want to say that for almost all components of U on prescribed K positions, say the first, the second, and the tenth, and all components on, on the remaining D minus K positions, for all lengths of our sum N, you have a statement of this type, where X, X, X is whatever you can prove. The best bound you can do, depending on the positions you fix, on K and maybe on something else. So it's kind of a, a prototype of the statements I want to to, to, to prove. And this scenario was considered by several people, for example, by Flaminian and Forney, 2014. Then Trevor Woolley uh, revised this topic and used uh, a very different approach to obtain results of this type. And then finally, uh, Chen Gao Chen and myself last year also uh, worked on this and we obtained several results in this direction, which I will now present. But I want to reformulate it in a slightly convenient form. Instead of saying we want to fix coordinates in some, some positions, I will always be fixing them on the first k positions. But for this case, in this case, I need to permute the functions. And once I permute the functions, I can as well generalize it to a different situation. So, so I assume that I have d linearly independent with constant polynomials, meaning that no linear combination of them uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is constant. It's not enough to say that it's non-zero. They need to avoid constant functions. And given a vector u, I define this function. I call it t, not s. s is reserved for the classical while sums. t means that we have linear combinations of some polynomials. And of course, when psi i is t i, this is just a classical while sums. Now, <clears throat> I take my vector u and decompose it into two parts, part x of dimension k and part y of dimension d minus k. So my vector now has two components. And instead of writing t u n, I will write t x y. So I will separate comp com two components of, of, of u. OK. And now, following this uh, work of Flaminio and Favni and Trevor Woolley, we are interested in bounds on the sums of the following four shape. They should hold for almost all x and all y. So some components uh, 
for, uh, for uh, some components x are allowed to be kind of some of them are allowed to be discarded some set of x but we need it for all y's equivalently we are interested in bounds on this quantity so it should be certainly have absolute value and my, my apologies we should certainly talk about the uh, uh, largest absolute value of the sums maximize over all y's and we want this bounds to be true for almost all values of x so it's soup with respect to y and almost all with respect to x so an interpretation of this is, is the following we take our sum t u n and project all the sums along y components and we take the largest sum in each in each projection and we want a bound which holds for almost all x coordinates this is what we call it projection we basically just take all sums with the values of i which is the same as projecting the sum okay to formulate this result the results we need to introduce another important parameter which i call sigma with two parameters k and phi of course this this uh, vector of functions functions we are given so to some of the degrees of polynomials in the y part polynomials over which we maximize and in this case uh Vully proves the following estimate assume that k is between one and d minus one so this means that you at least have something in the y component because k is the number is the dimension of vector x then assuming that uh, our set of functions has an anterior Ronskian, it's a necessary condition which is easy to see for almost all x you have this bound the largest value of the sums tips phi x y over n doesn't exceed n to the one half of course one half must be here plus some losses or what one would expect what you know just for pure oil sums and this gamma which i call the gamma w uh, in honor of uh, Wooly, has this form and uh, uh, last year Changao and i managed to get a little bit better we reduce this exponent gamma uh, by subtracting one and two from here which you can see gives a larger value okay so the bounds are non-trivial if this exponent extra extra exponent gamma is less than one half because we already have one half which means that sigma the sum of degrees of in the y part should be at most this and please know that if we're in the classical case when you just permute this function t t squared t sub d it's always satisfied in the more, more general case well it's a matter of luck it depends how your functions look like if they contain polynomials of huge degrees then of course you have nothing to do with uh, this condition will be violated so uh, in the general case we don't always have non-trivial results and the, but the problem is still um, still makes sense and it would be nice to find a method to address it we also have some specialized bounds but I probably skip this it's not so important but I want to come back to the link I mentioned link between projections of while sums something which we have discussed and upper bounds on the dimension of this set e alpha d the set which we, did, we defined here uh, to establish this link we need to consider a new scenario a slightly more general scenario uh, where we consider arbitrary projections before we just discarded y coordinates now we want to do something else so we consider col uh, the collection of all k dimensional linear subspaces of rd and phi sub double sub sub v denotes orthogonal pro projection onto this linear space v so we project not necessarily with respect to y coordinates but we consider projections on other spaces and uh, very much as we did with uh, e of alpha d 
we consider this set, which define it exactly the same, except that, except for the while sum, I consider my more general sums with linear combinations of other polynomials. And the set of u for which the sums are large. So the question we want to ask is given this set of polynomials phi, for what alpha we the measure, the Lebesgue measure of the square Jacklin is zero for all for all possible linear spaces. Well, what what can we say from our previous result? From our previous result, with this exponent, we know that if alpha is greater than this exponent, then the Lebesgue measure of this projection pi dk is zero, where pi dk is a specific projection, where we just discovered the last d minus k components. Now we are after more general projections, not just pi dk, but projections on arbitrary linear spaces. And uh, we have a series of results, slightly weaker bounds, which means that our gammas, which appears in these results, are larger, but we still have results. Our method gave the results for this uh, arbitrary projections. And this allows us to address this issue, link projections of wild sums to upper bound on the dimension, on the house of dimension of exceptional sets. And it's based on the classical result of Mastrat and Matilda, which is known as Mastrat and Matilda projection theorem. I don't want to give any formal definitions, just informally, it says the following. Assume that you have a set A, and you think about this set A is a set of our uh, vectors U, and assume that all, most all K dimensional projections are massive. Massive means of almost uh, full measure, of, of full measure. Then, the house of dimension of the set should be large. And as large as the, the dimension of the space, subspaces which you can control. The larger subspaces you control, the larger bound you get. So it's exactly the link which allows us to use results on projections of whale sums to obtain upper bounds on uh, dimensions of the sets. Okay. Well, now I want to talk about something else, about links between this direction and partial differential equations. I won't say much about partial differential equations, but at least I explain what sums appear uh, in, the, uh, in this area. And I think it was discovered by Erdogan and Shakan last year, who noticed that the previous equation with this very special set of polynomials, a polynomial psi of x, which could be anything. Uh, the most, most commonly is x to the d, but not necessary. And this linear combination of phi of x and just x. So we have only two, two functions in your system. Uh, this, this function appears in the investigation of some partial differential equations. So what we want? We want to answer an equation of the previous type, namely, we want to know what's the smallest possible value of theta such that for any polynomial phi of t of degree m, any coefficient tau, which appears here, for almost all x, this sums are less than n to the theta. So you have d equals two, you have only two functions, k equals one. One coefficient is is, uh, is you maximize over one coefficient and take almost all values of the other coefficient. And you want to know what's the best bound you can get here. So it's exactly the previous scenario. Uh, and when Chang'e and I looked at this, we thought that, well, it's a done deal. We just apply our result. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, as I said, our previous results, they give some non-trivial bounds, but not always. It's never guaranteed. It depends on the luck on the structure of the exponent. Here we, we didn't get lucky, so we didn't get nothing with the result it's itself, but the method works. So basically we had to revise our method in this particular scenario. And 
then we obtain some results. And uh, well, as I said, this function is related to partial differential equations. And uh, here, it's at least two particular types where this equation appears. And it was discovered by Erdogan and Shokan in their very nice paper. Of course, this sums looks very strange and nobody would probably look at them, but the, the existence is justified by these links. So what we know now, uh, we know the following. So in their paper, they proved that you can take theta. Theta m is the best exponent, the best value of theta, to be uh, the smallest out of these two quantities. This comes from the classical Weil method, from the Van der Kolk method, and this comes from Vinogradov, Bourguin, Demeter, Goods. Uh, and uh, using our method, we improved it a little bit, and we have kind of a way uh, lengthy result which gives specific exponents for small values of m and then a formula uh, semi-explicit formula for larger values of m but the upshot is this function r of m is about square root of m so we ignore it and this zero and one also ignores this so what we have uh, in the denominator we have two times sm where sm is more or less m times m minus one over two while they have m times m minus one. So it's twice uh, larger or smaller, depending on the point of view, asymptotically for large values of m. So this is what our methods give. And just in the remaining uh, few minutes, I want to outline very briefly ideas behind the proofs. So how we obtained these results. None of these ideas is new, but we put it in a slightly different context. Well, the first idea, which was used by many people, starting from, from Vinogradov, is the continuity of while sums. So it says the following. You have two vectors of coefficients, u and v, and assume that they're close to each other. Because you work with continuous, continuous functions, of course, the sums will be close to each other as well. And you can make a quantitative statement of this type. OK. So and this statement actually works as, as stated and has been used. But we notice that this can be used only in the first step. And we introduce something which uh, kind of was used recursively. And we invented something which we called self-improving argument. So you use this principle as the first step and you have a result. And you know that for almost all values of u, your sums are small. And Please remember, they're small for all values of n. It's important. This is why changing the order between n and u was, in our results, was very, very important. So now for all, almost all values of u, the sums are small. Next time you, you estimate the difference between su and sv, you use partial summation. And in partial summation, you obtain sums of this type, for which you already have a non-trivial result. So you improve your previous estimate and you use it recursively until you, <clears throat> you come to kind of fixed point of the recursion, which gives you a bound. It does give you an optimal result, but it improves you what one can get as a first step. So that was one of the things which allowed us to get new results. And the second idea is also a very old idea, which also goes back to Vinograd. In fact, appears on even before his mean value theorem. Now it has a generic name, completion methods. So what do you want to, 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 to say? You want to say that for almost all values of u, for almost all, almost all coefficients, these sums are small for all values of n. Again, it's important for us to have it in this order. If first throw away a bad set of vectors u, and then we want <coughs> this bounds for all values of n. <clears throat> this means that for each n, we have to control the size of exceptional sets. And we want this to be small. So if mu of n is the measure of the exceptional set for which the sums are not small, we need to show that this series converges. This, this is to say that for almost all n, we have, we have an upper bound. But it will give you something, this approach, but it's not so good because you have to deal with each n individual. You have 
say if you want to deal with all sets up to capital M, you have to control M different sets. It's too much. This approach doesn't completely fail, it just gives a weak result. So what we did, we use completion methods. Namely, instead of using this sums, completion methods allows us to control each of the sums for all n in this dyadic range with just one sum. And the sum certainly looks ugly in scale, but in fact it's harmless. All this kind of fudge which you have to add gives you no trouble. So what's the fudge? First of all, you have a summation between minus n and m, one over h. Well, we know how to handle harmonic series. Then the, in the exponent, we have the same linear combination plus one linear term. And linear terms usually change nothing in our argument. So this is why the sums are not so difficult to estimate more or less with the same quality as for initial while sums. So instead of dealing with n sums, if you want to say, make a statement from these measures up to capital M, you have to control only log M sets U for which these sums, say supported on powers of two are small and it's much easier. And this also allowed us to get a better result. And I think uh, my time is up, so it's time to stop. And uh, I would really appreciate questions or even more I would appreciate answers. Thank you so much, Igor. Please, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Please unmute your uh, microphone such that we can properly thank Igor. I'm doing how to look at